Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our, our fifth and final panel of the conference. Um, I should start off by saying I am pinch hitting today for <clears throat> Dr. Doyle Hodges, uh, executive editor of the Texas National Security Review, who couldn't be with us today, um, is feeling a little bit under the weather, but we thank Doyle for all of his hard, hard work in advance of today's event, and thank this all-star panel that will close us out um, today with some, some good recommendations Given all of the problems we've been discussing for the past day and a half, they don't need any intro introduction, but I will persist regardless. Um, and I'll start um, at the end here with uh, Peter Fever, a, a professor of political science and public policy at Duke University, uh, where he runs the program in Ameri American Grand Strategy, and where he also co-chairs the America and the World Consortium, which we have co-partnered with to host this conference. You may be aware he's reminded the audience probably a half dozen times in the past day and a half that he has a book coming out. <laughs> Thanks for your service. The causes and consequences of public confidence in the military. And he wanted me to make sure I told you it's available for pre-order yeah. on Oxford <laughs> University Press. Corey Shockey is a senior fellow and the director of foreign and defense policy <clears throat> studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining AEI, she was the Deputy Director General at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. She's worked at the State Department, the Defense Department, the National Security Council, has taught in a variety of premier institutions, and is the author of several books, including Safe Passage, The Transition from British to American Hegemony. Lieutenant General David Barno, US Army retired, is a visiting professor of strategic studies at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. He completed a 30-year military career where he commanded at every level, culminating as the commander of all US and coalition forces in Afghanistan from 2003 to 2005. He's a co-author with Dr. Nora Bensahel of the 2020 book, Adaptation Under Fire, and is also a co-author of the Strategic Outpost column at War on the Rocks. He's a West Point graduate and a proud alum of our program here in the Security <laughs> Studies program at Georgetown, and it's great to welcome him back home. And last but not least, Michelle Flournoy is co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors, a strategic advisory firm here in Washington, DC. She served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2009 to 2012. <clears throat> Prior to that, she co-founded and led the Center for a New American Security, where she now chairs the board. She also serves on a number of government advisory and private sector boards. We're thrilled to have you all here today. And as we were talking about just a few moments ago, our four previous panels, our multiple keynotes that we've had over the past couple of days, have done a great job of defining a myriad of problems that shape the civil military landscape today. We would be remiss if we, if we adjourned here without a good discussion of tangible and recommended solutions. And that is what today's panel is all about. And so without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle, for some opening great. comments. Wonderful. Well, um, great to be here. And thank you all for sticking it out to the last uh, panel. Um, and thank you for hosting this. It's such an important discussion at a time when um, polarization in our politics is really corrupting a lot of our norms and institutions and is starting to hurt the esteem with which uh, America, the American people hold the military as an institution in a way that's somewhat alarming. So um, I know you've spent a lot of time defining the different aspects of the problem. Um, so I'm going to dive in as asked right into some recommendations. Um, so the first is um, education and training of key leaders, both military and civilian. Um, we know that military officers uh, at multiple times throughout their professional education and development do get courses uh, and units on civil military relations. And I'm sure you've had some discussion, if, since Peter is here and General Barno is here, about the sort of the quality of that um, education. I, th I, I too often think we, we teach a theory that is not really, a, doesn't accord with reality. And so I do think there are ways to improve um, officer education that sort of really helps them prepare for what they'll deal with in practice as opposed to in theory. 
But that kind of education and training has been virtually absent on the civilian side. I know when I walked into the Pentagon for the first time, no one offered me any training whatsoever. The only thing I could go on was that I was, I was a military spouse, so I had some familiarity with the, with the institution, but that was just happenstance. Um, and so something that Peter and I, and I know Corey's worked on this too, have working on sort of modules for training the civilians who come into key roles in Office of the Secretary of Defense, in the service secretariats, and also, very importantly, in the National Security Council. And I'll say to the credit of this administration, they did some of that you know, at the outset. But that's absolutely key to help people understand what does civilian control mean? It doesn't mean that every civilian is in charge. <laughs> um, it means that you know, as a staffer, you're supporting a system that has presidential control exercised through the Secretary of Defense. Um, but helping them understand that, the norms, the ways they can get in trouble, how to avoid that is really key. The second key thing I would recommend is setting the tone at the top. And I lived uh, the change from Aspen Powell back in the day um, to Perry Shalley. And it was night and day. And when, when Perry and Shalley came into their respective roles, they understood that um, the civil-military relationship had become, reached nadir. It had become toxic. And they said, you know, to all, I remember being called in as a civilian in policy and being told, watch what we do, and you're going to get on board with a new way of interacting with your joint staff <clears throat> and military counterparts. And if you can't handle that change, you will not survive on this staff. But this has got to stop, and we're changing it. And there was fault on both sides. But that leadership to set the tone at the top, who, what is, you know, clarity about roles, Clarity about processes. One of the things that Gates, uh, Secretary Gates, um, another great secretary I had a chance to work for, did very good on sitting down with each of his principals, civilian and military, and describing what are their roles, where do you have decision rights, where is that shared, and processes that enforce what he expects. And so, for example, it was understood by service chiefs, by the chairman, by COCOMs. You don't come into the secretary's office with anything for decision without first going to the policy chief and then to the lawyer, uh, the, uh, the, the general counsel. And if you haven't done that, don't bother knocking on the door. I mean, there have got to be certain, you have to allow the secretary to staff um, proposals from the military uh, so he can exercise appropriate control. Um, another example is when I was in, in the Obama administration, um, there's also a civil dimension with the military from the White House staff and the NSC staff, and you guys have lived this before. They, and things can get a little out of hand, um, where, you know, I remember Secretary Gates visiting Afghanistan and saw that um, Doug Lute, bless him, his had speed dial on General McChrystal's phone. He's <laughs> like, rip the phone out of the wall. That is not happening. You are not taking taskers directly from, from the White House. But it got to the point where Chairman Mullen and I actually wrote, co-wrote a memo of here are rules of the road for how we collectively work together, like OS, you know, joint staff response to OSD and also with <clears throat> NSC and vice versa, constraints on, on that. And we had to like literally write it down, promulgate it, and, and then hold people accountable to it. Enforcing it is key, actually, to, to success. I think um, similarly, having rules of engagement and particularly educating civilians on what um, is appropriate for, to expect when military officers are called to testify. Because as part of their confirmation, they sign you know, a pledge to Congress to speak truthfully. This is the General Shinseki example where he was asked, what do you really think it's gonna take in Iraq? And he answered truthfully and then Rumsfeld sort of drummed him out. But we've gotta train both military and civilians on what is the appropriate um, approach for military testifying before Congress? And then I um, uh, have two more. Um, the one is on, for civilian leadership, resisting the temptation to use military, uniformed military, as props, <clears throat> political props, whether it's the photo op in Lafayette Square that we saw with President Trump that General Milley later apologized for, or whether it's political conventions. Because they, 
in terms of use of retired uh, uh, general officers and flag officers, we may have some difference of view. I have no problem with these people, you know, exercising their rights as citizens. But when you put a general officer on a, on a convention stage, you know, calling, you know, being very vocal in support of a particular candidate, it's confusing to most Americans. You know, the, the, their first name is General or Admiral, you know, for the rest of their lives. And it, that politicization is is a problem in my view. One thing we can do is to try to negotiate, this may be a little unrealistic, but we should try pacts among campaigns to say, we're not gonna do this. We won't do it if you don't do it. I personally, just as a matter of principle, refuse to be part of the recruiting effort the last two times around, because I think it's bad, it's, it's negative for civil military relations and for the institution. We should try to get more people to come out against that and agree not to do it. Um, I think um, the last thing I'll say is um, non-interference by senior civilians in the military justice system. The damage that was done by President Trump intervening in the Gallagher affair um, was uh, very serious. We, in, we, you know, when civilians intervene in that way, you deny <coughs> the military system its ability to hold itself accountable, to enforce its own norms, to educate its own rank and file and leaders, and to you know, sort of keep true to the norms that are so critical to the institution. So I think that's, that's the last one I put on the table. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Dave. Well, great, thanks. And it's uh, terrific to be back here at Georgetown where the uh, accommodations are much nicer than what I remember many, many years ago. <laughs> so uh, Georgetown's obviously doing well. And, and I was uh, kidding. Uh, uh, Heidi, that our, our digs down at 1619 Massachusetts Avenue at SICE these days are, are pretty, uh, pretty dismal compared to this, but we are moving to a brand new building, 555 Penn, here uh, this summer. So we're excited about that, the former museum building, which is being uh, remodeled for uh, all three of the Johns Hopkins schools down here. So this is a great opportunity to talk to uh, an audience about a topic that uh, I've thought about a lot, been involved a lot with, with in my life. I've written a lot uh, about with uh, Dr. Nora Bensahel, as you heard in, in our bios briefly. And I guess one of the things is I was reflecting on what to talk about today. I won't have as many specific uh, recommendations as Michelle because uh, I'm, I'm perplexed about some of the things that uh, need to happen and how we're going to get from where we are to actually achieving them. Uh, but I will talk about what I think the military can do, certainly internally, to reinforce uh, some of the things that they already do, although I think only evenly, and then but I would also point out some of the challenges I think they're having in, inside the force itself. Uh, one of the things that uh, you hear when you get promoted to one-star general in the military, typically, and it's kind of an old saw, is that you're told that you're now a general. Uh, from this point forward, you will never again have a bad meal, and you, are ne <laughs> you will never again hear the truth. Uh, and the second one of those is certainly uh, fairly accurate. The first one I found to be not yes. quite up to up, up <laughs> expectations. But the other thing, is, as Michelle noted, is that your first name from that point forward is general. And that stays with you for the rest of your life, not just for the rest of your military career. So you actually have, in my view, some responsibilities uh, because of that title, because of that permanent affiliation you have with the military that doesn't correspond to what a retired sergeant major or a retired colonel or Navy captain might have because those titles tend to you know, become much more invisible as you move off into your post-military career. Generals and admirals keep those first names for the rest of their career. And because of that, they have some special responsibilities. So as I thought about the, the topic, and I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately was not able to attend yesterday, so I'm, I'm not tuned in entirely to all the key things that you discussed. But as I thought about this topic, a couple of the, the things that occurred to me is there's, there's really maybe three or four buckets that from a, the military standpoint uh, this fits into. One is that what, what's the civil military relationship today between active duty general officers, flag officers, and their civilian counterparts? Uh, reflecting on the, the last panel and second part, probably what's that look like for the uh, National Guard in the reserves? Um, what does that look like in terms of the retired community, retired flag officers and generals? And then finally, a, a category I don't know if we talked about during the earlier parts of the conference that, I, that I'm worried about that, that it really uh, comes as a concern. And I think in some ways is at the top of the list and maybe the toughest nut to crack. What happens with these relationships in periods of in extremis? Uh, and I would define that as the last 90 days, for example, of the last administration. Uh, when all the, even in the, you know, the first 
3.9 years of the Trump administration, most of the basic norms were still out there. They were discernible. Uh, there were issues that were brought up. There were you know, calls for correction when we had issues with uh, USS John McCain being covered up initially in the, the harbor in, in uh, Japan before a presidential visit on the Eddie Gallagher case, as Michelle has noted. But there were, there were calls to adjust back to what we thought the norms were. And there were enough adults, I would say, uh, in confirmed positions throughout the administration and enough of a, a uh, relationship between the senior military leaders and those confirmed, you know, mostly cabinet appointees and, and their subordinate appointees, that, that it was understood that there had to be adjustments made back into the norms. In the last 90 days of administration, that, that was largely swept away, and, and many of those confirmed appointees were gone, and the military found itself in some uncharted waters. The nation was in uncharted waters. And that, that particular window of time, uh, I was as astonished as anybody to see transpire, but w there, there are some very big issues we need to think about and take take from that, and I don't think we've actually addressed those adequately yet. And, and I'm, I am not the first person in line to have all the recommendations to fix that, but it, it is the most worrisome thing I see out there in the civil-military relationship domain that I actually have seen very little written about, very little spoken about, uh, and is, is in a sense almost the worst case <clears throat> scenario that we encountered, we navigated through. You know, there's been lots of criticism. There'll be a lot more books written about that, I know, in the future, I'm sure. Uh, and, but we really haven't dissected what can we do to not have those kind of situations evolve again. And, and if they do evolve, what should the right answer be for the senior military leadership out there? So I, I offer that more as a question than as something I have a pocket full of prescriptions for here today. I, I do want to talk briefly about, uh, again, and we'll discuss more of this, I think, as we continue, but what can the military be doing internally? I'm, I'm a bit worried today, just anecdotally, that there is, there is a lack of consensus inside the military about what exactly are the proper norms of civil military relations, what's the proper role of the military. One, one example of that I think would be there's, and this certainly comes from outside the military as well, how, how the chairman behaved during his uh, couple of years in the Trump administration, Chairman Milley specifically in, in the latter part of the administration, and then during that very difficult period of time in the last 90 days, but really the last year of the, the Trump era what role did, did uh, General Milley pay, play as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Was it appropriate or not? There is not a uniform set of opinions on that inside the military and certainly not outside the military. So, so that's of concern. I, I do uh, think, and I would uh, applaud, as, as Michelle has noted, what the military does internally in some of their more formal programs for education on civil military affairs. But I also think they're a bit sterile. They're a bit antiseptic, and they're, they're too hypothetical. And we now have some painful case studies to actually assess. But until we arrive within the military at some consensus on what the right standards are from senior leadership all the way down to people in the rank and file, both active, guard and reserve, what roles they play in the political discourse, especially in what we've seen in the last four years, and in some ways are seeing still today with the amount of politicization, especially on Capitol Hill, and how the military has now been drawn into that in a way that we can't really untangle at this point in time. What should the military be doing internally? So I think, again, as Michelle pointed out, some of these programs to hopefully educate jointly senior political appointees that are arriving and military senior leaders that are going to interact with them, more programs uh, within the military and perhaps by led by some universities for three and four star officers who are going to be at the forefront of dealing with these challenges. Then I think we need some specifically targeted programs uh, for officers that get uh, appointed and confirmed as combatant commanders and as the service chiefs and vice chiefs and chairman and vice chairman. Those are at the very you know, cutting edge of the civil military relationship. Those are the people that are gonna go on Capitol Hill to testify. They've got posture hearings coming up. Uh, they're gonna be interacting with members and many of them are gonna have a direct relationship with the president and absolutely the secretary of defense. They don't get any education at all to speak of for those specific jobs that I'm aware of. And I think we need to fix that. Uh, so, again, lots of challenges out there. Uh, I kind of highlighted what I thought the most concerning one was. Hopefully, we'll discuss that a bit more as we continue. But this is a, an area that, in some ways, I think we're, we're in deeper water, certainly, than I've ever seen in, in my, my career in, in public service. So I hope we get to pick apart some of those things today and come up with some good ideas. Corey. 
Uh, so I would suggest four things I think need to uh, happen. The first, and it's the work of everybody in this room in addition to the work of our military, which is to, we have got to help the American people understand the difference between people in the military and veterans. Because the restrictions on civil military that get built into civil military relations are out of concern that the military will uh, impede democratic governance. The other word for veterans is citizens. And I just, I, I don't see any practical way that politicians are gonna stop putting uh, service men and women in their political ads. Both campaigns did it last time. At least one of those two campaigns knew an awful lot better than to do that, and they did it anyway. And so I, I just think the arms race is gonna continue until Americans stop liking the military. Um, as, as Professor Urban said yesterday, it would be fabulous if other institutions in American public life had restored credibility in the way the military has. Uh, until that happens, politicians are gonna hide behind uniforms um, and use them for political purposes. And veterans are gonna see uh, opportunities to either get famous, get a political appointment, or uh, you know, be a major voice for the salvation of the republic and engage in political activity. <clears throat> so I agree that it would be virtuous if those things didn't happen and we would have a stronger, healthier civil military relationship and a less partisan pressure on the military. But I, as a practical matter, I don't think it's gonna happen. And therefore, helping, uh, you know, my mom in Northern California understand that some retired three star who's banging on at a political convention actually doesn't represent the views of the military. They represent the views of that person. I think it's really important. They're gonna keep their title, but ambassadors keep their title and city council presidents keep their titles. And that's not problematic in the same way because the public has the familiarity to understand that they're not speaking for a powerful institution in government. So all of us have work to do to help people understand that veterans actually aren't the same thing as the military. The same restrictions don't apply to them. They behave like idiots just like the rest of us do. And you shouldn't impart uh, outsized weight to their views on anything other than what they did in military service. I think that's the most important thing for restoring, um, for defanging some of the concerns about politicization. Because um, in my, albeit limited experience, the leadership of the military is desperate to try and rein in the behavior of retired senior leaders, but it's, and the public makes no distinction at all. So we gotta help them understand. Um, so that's the first and most important thing. And we should enlist the help of members of Congress, particularly the armed services folks who get this problem. The second thing um, I think is important, Michelle raised this, we need to help prepare the military better for the bare knuckled brawl of congressional testimony and for dealing with political leaders. Um, because uh, I know I said this yesterday, the great Admiral Zumwalt example, uh, there's a, a parallel on congressional testimony and it, or dealing with politicians. And it's when Jim Mattis was the CENTCOM commander, he tried to complain to Britain's prime minister, Tony Blair, that that the political leadership was giving him conflicting objectives. And Prime Minister Blair's response was, if you can't ride two ponies, you have no business being in the circus. Because that's what it's like for politicians, right? And what he was saying was, you are placing unreasonable expectations that a political process is never gonna produce for you. So, you know, you can tell me to be better at my job, but one of the two of us is the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Um, 
And, and so I think helping, you know, we ought to enlist uh, congressional staffers to be the people who prepare um, folks for congressional testimony, because they can tell you what Senator Cotton or Senator Fisher is going to throw at you um, and how to give an answer that's not going to make you unconfirmable or require every other two star in every service to give, to give an answer on a subject nobody wants to give an answer to or do damage to the institution or civil military relations. So we should think more carefully about how without making our military leadership into politicians, we can help them understand how to interface with politicians. And that's a really hard line to skate, but it looks to me like we are too far on the side of um, stiff-necked, stiff starched uniform virtue on the part of our military, and it's making their, this is how they put their foot into wolf traps on political issues. Uh, the third thing I would suggest is turn off televisions in military offices. The partisan splatter of you know, Fox News and MSNBC, uh, it, it's creating pressure for politicization internal to the military, and it's creating perceptions <clears throat> of political alignment, both within and without um, units. And I really think, you know, Chester Nimitz managed to prosecute World War II in the Pacific without real-time information and political views being broadcast into his office every day. We can do this, my friends. Turn the TVs off. It both creates the perception and introduces politicization into, you know, uh, airplane mechanics, hangar stations, and every place else. And I guess the last thing is that, uh, and this one is for our friends in the military, which is it's incredibly, this is a terribly uncomfortable moment in American politics, and everything feels politicized. You know, I was watching the Twitter exchanges about a, a comment about Fort Liberty being the name of Fort Bragg, uh, and, and somebody complained that, uh, you know, um, that politicization uh, is coming in all of this, and so it's good to have Fort Liberty, because that can never be politicized. And one of the duffel blog writers was like, oh, you're two weeks away from liberty <laughs> itself being politicized. And I think that's actually right. Um, and um, what I noticed when I was in government is that, um, you know, you, you create converts one cup of coffee at a time. And the to the extent that people get to know each other across those lines. That is, you know, when Mark Hurtling was a frocked one star as the J-8 and I was the director for defense strategy on the NSC, we would have a cup of coffee from time to time. And that made him seem less like, you know, a danger to democratic governance. Uh, and it made me smarter. We gave each other the benefit of the doubt as a result of that. And I think those kinds of relationships where military folks share the sense of their culture, because that's what I'm headed to. If you are not defining your culture, somebody else is doing it for you. And the military is leaving too much space for its culture to be defined by others. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, the Pat Donahoe um, uh, case study that everybody ought to have to think their way through. What would you have done? Um, and defending your culture is actually an important part of creating space where politicization can't intrude. Um, and I think 
doing that both as an institution and one cup of coffee at a time with political actors would actually be really helpful for the military in defending itself against this partisan pressure. Thanks, Corey. Okay, I have uh, seven items, uh, uh, seven suggestions. The first one, this has come up repeatedly over the last two days, we need to help Corey's mom. <laughs> and I was thinking, what would help her? And I thought, maybe if she had a book on public confidence in the military. So I'm going to take can that. Can it be pre-ordered? <laughs> yes, uh, it can be pre-ordered. Okay. More seriously, my other six. Um, uh, Michelle took one of them, I, uh, which was the training for Schedule C civilian appointees. I would make a friendly amendment and say, and also congressional staff. I think we have had very little penetration yep. in this space <clears throat> over there, and that would be important. Uh, next, I would recommend that uh, the open letter that the SECDEFs and the former SECDEFs, former chairman did, that that be recorded required uh, in nominations, confirmation hearings, that we ask everyone at you know the four-star level and above and civilians to say, do you agree with that? Do you, and if not, where do you disagree with that? We already asked them about a lot of other things that are more politicized, but that's an attempt at laying out what are the best practices, the, uh, the norms. And Dave, in response to your, your good observation, while the writing of that, you know, is is vague and sort of polished down, if you will, not sharp edge, it had in mind the um, the fact that we had the wrong set of norms being applied to senior leaders, to include General Milley at in the last ninety days, but also uh, Milley and Austin even today. Uh, what were what is expected of them? And if you go on cable news, you're getting one grading rubric for them. And this was this letter was an attempt to say, no, use this grading rubric for them and all future leaders. And so I think it's a start uh, to towards what you're you were rightly asking for. Um, and uh, as Corey likes to remind us, we have to grade them uh, like Olympic divers, as Corey. <laughs> I, the one shocking thing I learned on this conference is that I was not the first person to say that. I thought, man, such a brilliant concept. I must have come up with it, but in fact, Corey did, so thank you. Okay, and thank you for reminding me. Um, next, I think we need to push both sides in the military is woke debate, both sides, to admit that it's possible to overdo attention to DEI concerns and it's possible to underdo attention to DEI concerns, that I, today the military is caught in this peculiar kind of politicized vice that is exacerbated by partisan politics. And a sig significant fraction of the civilian superiors to the military are talking as if it's impossible to underdo attention <laughs> to DEI. When of, uh, we all know, and we should be <laughs> remember on the 75th anniversary of the executive order that integrated the military that yes, it is possible to underdo it and to be uh, insufficiently inclusive of Americans who we need <laughs> to be serving in order to meet the geopolitical threat. So it is possible to underdo it, but there's, and there's a fraction of the civilian leaders who talk as if that's impossible. But then I think some of the other civilian leaders seem to be talking as if it's impossible to overdo it. And I like Bob Gates's uh, quote, I think it's uh, Secretary Gates who said this, that on any given day in an organization as big as the DOD, there's some person out there doing something stupid that will get me in trouble. Uh, I think it's possible that there are examples of it being overdone uh, and that we, sh we should, and that done in a way that hurts mission readiness. And if so, we should, identify those, fix those, and get back to the happy medium where we're paying a due attention to DEI concerns, not underdoing it and not overdoing it. And falling off the horse on either side, I think, is detrimental to the effectiveness of the military. And I hope that we can get the uh, uh, sort of a compromise <laughs> middle ground position on that uh, that would move us forward. 
Next, uh, this is contra more contra well, <laughs> maybe even more controversial. I think we should rethink the veterans' preference for hiring within OSD. I think we should preserve it for the rest of the government, but within OSD, I think there should be a set aside or cut out, carve out that says the veterans' preference is not strictly enforced within OSD. We need a ca cadre a of idea. civilian, uh, you know, future Michelle Flournoy's who are not veterans themselves, but are genuine national security experts, you know, equal to any anyone else who has served. Uh, and it's hard to grow that if the jobs are all taken by retired uh, military. Um, so I, I like veterans' preference for hiring, but not within OSD. Uh, I think I'm more optimistic than Corey is on the prospects for norm enforcement on the list of endorsers. And so my wow. next next proposal, which is actually Zach Griffith's idea, but it's a great one, so I'm endorsing it. Did you catch that? That was a little I pun did. there. Okay. I did. Is... <laughs> is to have a more lustrous list of open non-endorsers so that the oh. list would be, these are all the people who ha are saying they are not going to endorse either candidate. Mm -hmm. And I think I, we all know that the list of those people is more lustrous than the list of any endorsing group we've ever had. They just aren't collected and put their names down. But I think we might be able to do that uh, in the 24 cycle. You're right that we'll never be able to get, well, you proposed that, uh, Michelle, I don't think we'll ever get the campaigns. Because if you couldn't convince the folks inside uh, Clinton and Biden campaign to do it, then I don't think there's anyone with the stature who could convince them. And I remember talking to uh, a person I won't name, who said, I know you're right, Peter, but if I if we don't and the other side does, then it looks like we're, you know, we're bad. Notice though the list. Compare the list in 20 to the list in 2016 yep. to the list in 2012, and it is markedly less lustrous. Yep. And the Biden team hid that fact by merging them with retired. Uh, civilians, uh, not just, say, weren't just military, but they were national security professionals who were civilians. I think, Michelle, you were on the list. And, uh, you know, they'd served in the intelligence community or whatever, and that made it long, but it hid the fact that they actually didn't get as many four stars as they, as Clinton had gotten in 2016 or Obama had gotten in 2012. So I think that norm is happening, uh, is growing, and it just needs a little push. That's my... Uh, my th uh, theory, and I think Zach's idea of getting a, uh, a list of, of non-endorsers would be good. Um, and then my last idea, which is on civics education. And I know yesterday I said that that's, you know, a fool's errand. Whom God would destroy, they first try to reform the interagency and improve civics education. Um, but I was thinking about it after saying that, that there is actual civics education that's happening for reals. It's reaching the public. It's called Hollywood. Mm. Now, is all of that good? No, much of it is not good. Uh, it's because it's designed to entertain rather than educate. But to a significant fraction of the public, I dare say that is the source of their information about civil military relations, about military culture, et cetera, for good or for ill. Uh, now, this is tricky because uh, uh, General Dempsey and I teach a course on uh, grand strategy through film, and my students uh, are very sensitive to the question of whether the Pentagon cooperated with the directors uh, and thus contaminated the movie with propaganda. That's their the, the argument they're making. So. Can't trust Top Gun uh, because that got, you know, military cooperation. Can trust Apocalypse Now because they didn't. And I go, hmm, <laughs> you know. Um, and then General Dempsey spontaneously combusted. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
the, so uh, there is a, I, for the target demographic, right, who would be my students, they, uh, there is a concern that if the Pentagon is cooperating to make it more accurate, that's propaganda. Mm. So you have to work that problem of it. But maybe the first step is to, uh, this is one part of the problem that we haven't admired in sufficient detail. So we need to get more funding for more research that homes in on what is Hollywood teaching about uh, military relations, military culture, and what, how can that be improved so that it, uh, it accomplishes the goal of civics education uh, at least Partly. And it would substantially improve our family's experience of watching television with yeah. us so we're not yelling at the TV. No, the Secretary of State in the Situation Room does not order the deployment of the military. Yeah. You know? What? what? I didn't know. Fair, fair point. So Great. back to you, Heidi. Uh, so just a, cu a couple follow-on questions to the remarks <laughs> you made here. Um, many of the scholars and practitioners in this room um, Many of you have written on some of these and spoken about these recommendations in the past. We collectively seem to have a breakthrough problem, right? That we get a lot of consensus in environments like this, and we have difficulty reaching our target audiences of the American public, of politicians and civilian elected leaders. What do we need to do better to reach them? Your letter that, that you helped facilitate was read by people in this room but not the American public, and probably not by many, many elected leaders. And so- You're killing me, but yes. To get, <laughs> to get to your point of having this be a tool to be used yes. for good in confirmation hearings, we have to have some breakthroughs here. And what do we need to do better, everybody here, on reaching our target audiences beyond academic journals, beyond um, public scholarship that I think everybody here has done a very good job of, um, but we haven't seen at least the, the desired effects that we hope to. What can we do better? Peter, I'll start with you and, and open it up to the panel. Well, a coup would help ga galvanize attention. Um, and uh, they had, the, uh, the retired sec defs and chairman had trouble landing that piece uh, because it was not partisan and sharp-edged enough. So uh, some places that might have you might have thought, okay, they'll run it with a wider <clears throat> reach uh, into middle America, say, said, you know, if you can sex this up and make it more partisan, then we can run it. And well, that's the whole point of it is to be non-partisan. <laughs> uh, so that doesn't work. I think the when it penetrates is when the, the sense of crisis is so great, and I think we were getting close to there in the last 90 days of the Trump administration, we certainly got there on January 6th. So some of the issues that are related to <clears throat> Civ Mill that are, were raised by January 6th, that penetrated into the public. So that's, that's actually not a helpful observation, right? Because it says the problem has to get a lot, lot worse before we can uh, penetrate. So uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. However, I will say that the very same show that annoys you about the sex state, yeah. you know, doing. On other issues, it, they, it does it pretty realistically. Yeah, yeah, right. And so <laughs> occasionally. So there are moments, and, and there have been one or two where I couldn't remember, well, did that crisis actually happen? Did, you know, or am I, did I only just see it on that TV show? So um, there, are, there may be some ways of getting thorny scenarios, thorny ethical dilemmas of the sort uh, Dave was talking about into shows that in a dramatic and entertaining fashion that would also educate. So maybe that would be a, one way to penetrate. But those, I, had, I recognize that's not a really great answer. Mm -hmm. Corey's better at this than I am. So. <laughs> Set me up, Peter. Um, two, I have two suggestions. First, I'd love to see a show of hands. When was the last time anybody in this room had a cup of coffee with a Senate or House Armed Services staffer to tell them why you thought this letter ought to be uh, required, right? Okay. 
everybody else you have work to do. Yeah. Um, so that's one way. Actually, you know, stop expecting magic to happen. <laughs> it happens one cup of coffee at a time. And the second thing is, write Hollywood screenplays, my friends. <laughs> like, the, or advise shows. <laughs> yeah, offer to be a consultant. If you see something, if you see dumbness on TV, wait until the credits scroll for the producer and write the producer a note and say, hey, you guys had this wrong. It's actually, I could help you with this and I'm inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I've written Scarlett Johansson a lot. She never <laughs> writes that. <laughs> That's because her security detail has the number on you, Peter. Um, so, right, like, big stuff happens in small increments and chip away at it. See, you know, don't expect magic to happen. Great. Michelle. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave, go, go right ahead. One, one angle I, I think would, would might be productive, and I haven't heard too much discussion about it. And I don't know if it actually happens behind the scenes and I don't see it. it, is the role of veterans and Congress reaching out to other veterans to set expectations of how they behave to influence other members who are not veterans in Congress. You know, for example, if the, the Secretary of Defense and the chairman sat down with the, the uh, chairman and the ranking members of the HASC and the SASC and said, we need your help. You know, Jack Reed's in here this morning, right? Uh, military veteran. 82nd Airborne, West Point grad, the, the epitome of the kind of person I'm talking about, to go out and, and talk to members who are veterans and start building some consensus among the veterans community in Congress about what are the acceptable norms of how we talk to the military here, what we ask them, what we don't ask them as, as a starting point. Uh, I know that uh, I've been watching a, a former uh, carpool colleague of mine who I drove to work with every day years ago as a young captain at Fort Benning, Georgia, was elected from a very conservative Texas district uh, this year, uh, and, is, and has spent 20 years in the military, was a county judge after that, is a, a very hard right Republican. I'm sure nobody in the veterans community and any other community have, have gone out and talked to him about, you're, you're now a new member, what's expected of you as a veteran here? How, how should you be thinking about helping to enforce the norms of the profession you spent you know, 20 years of your life in, 20 plus years? Nobody's going to do that. So th that community, and there's some very, obviously, there's some somewhat less responsible members of that community, in my judgment, and there's a lot of fairly responsible members on both sides of the aisle in that community that could actually play a catalytic role to, that might help change the tone over on the Hill, because that's one of the most prominent places where the American public sees this play out, and we haven't done nearly enough to try and change that dialogue. That's, yeah. that's one possibility. It's there cool. is actually a group called With Honor, which is trying to mm -hmm. build a bipartisan <coughs> caucus, four-country caucus um, in Congress made up of veterans, and this could be a really important kind of focal piece for them. Um, I do like the Hollywood ideas. Um, that would lower my blood pressure a lot. Um, but I also think that, you know, when we think about retired military folks at the senior level, general officer level, Many of them are going on the speaker surf circuit. They're, you know, they're speaking. They're joining boards. They are teaching. Um, they are having, a, you know, public profiles and sort of somehow creating among the retiree community, sort of helping them f feel the responsibility of talking about this and promulgating those norms. And really, um, they have huge platforms for public education that aren't necessarily being used. Um, so I think that that's an opportunity as well. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask one more question, then we'll open it up to the audience and the same rules as before. Please um, uh, line up behind the microphone stands. But the overarching title for this conference has been the All Volunteer Force at 50 civil military <clears throat> challenges and opportunities. And I thought I'd ask one final question on the, on the viability of the future of the all-volunteer force. Um, you know, we can look at many of the points of tension and friction that we've talked about the past uh, day and a half as perhaps being trade-offs of having a volunteer force. You have a military that's less known and less considered. You have an American public that looks at it with a mix of ignorance and reverence. Um, are these just costs of doing business with a volunteer force? 
Are there tweaks that we should be making to the system? We heard a provocative suggestion yesterday from Admiral Mullen that talked about a, a, a benefit of a draft and a conscripted force is you may increase um, representativeness from the society that you pull from. Um, your thoughts, and I'll leave it open to whoever wants to take that first. You, Michelle, you go first. I'll, I'll dive in first. Um, I am, because I'm probably the, not the expert on this, but um, as a mom of someone who's serving, as the husband of someone who, who served, I, you know, what I see is a force that's really struggling to, um, the recruiting challenge, appeal to the next generation. And this is where, while I agree with your points on DEI in principle, I think we have, part of the recruiting problem is that we still, there are pockets of young people that feel that this is not an inclusive environment that would welcome them. Um, and so given where we are right now, I do think you know, focusing on how we make the military truly attractive to a broader swath of the population is the problem of the day. And I'll just report when my son was graduating from the Naval Academy, the one applause line that had the whole, the, all the parents in the state, stadium stand up was when um, the speaker talked about solving the sexual harassment problem. And, and you, you know, it's incumbent on you as line leaders graduating, entering the fleet, we have got to stop this. We have got to create leadership climate where this is not tolerated. It's not going to happen. And, you know, women have to be fully welcomed and integrated into this force. And the whole stadium, and it was the parents <laughs> erupting, you know, and saying, yes, absolutely. So I, I, I do think um, that we've got to work hard on that. Um, but I also, to Admiral Mullen's point, I don't think the draft is an answer because we've all experienced the quality problems and the other problems that associate with that. And I just think it's unrealistic in this environment. I do think um, pushing on a norm of national service, we have lost something as a society because we don't have a common experience of service. Um, when you look at other countries, be they European or Israeli or whatever, there is a social cohesion that comes from basically everybody having to spend some time in service. It doesn't have to be military. Um, it could be other forms. I, again, we've seen many pieces of legislation be proposed, never pass. It probably won't happen by law. But everything we can do to create both the norm of public service and funded opportunities for public service and to have that be you know, the gap year that college uh, age folks um, choose, and that's what all of their friends are choosing. I mean, that's to me where realistically we should try to get to. Great, thank you. So I will say that uh, I am in violent agreement with Michelle that we have to solve the those kinds of uh, DEI uh, problems and the sexual assault issue is just the most, um, you know, tangibly visible problem, and we know from polling data that that actually is invoked by um, otherwise propensed people yeah. to, to join, and they say that's concerning them or their, their um, influencers, it's concerning them. So things like that we absolutely need to uh, get a hold of. So there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done to keep the all-volunteer force viable, and we have to, I think I said this yesterday, uh, we have to be willing to spend money inefficiently yeah. it, it, to recruit. Yep. Uh, so, but I will not believe that the all-volunteer force is non-viable until we run into these problems that we're seeing today during a period when the economy is tanking and there are no jobs mm. available and uh, when there hasn't been a, you know, a bow wave of the pandemic lockdown and the, yeah. the challenges that put on everybody, but especially recruiters. Uh, so I want to go through a period where it doesn't have those factors and we're still struggling. And if we're still struggling in that moment, then we have to, we have to take drastic mm -hmm. steps. Uh, but until, until then, I think we can uh, muddle through at a lot of effort. But then I, I'll say I also agree that national service, something that would uh, bring America 
things together is a, is a great idea. The implementation challenges of it, very, very hard. And so I don't have, I haven't solved the implementation problem. So, I mean, I have a principled objection to the notion of, of conscription. I, I don't think the government should have the right to compel service uh, of Americans. Yeah, but government's got enormous tools to affect <clears throat> people's choices. I mean, you know, there's conscription in, um, in Switzerland, and you can opt out of subscription conscription by paying higher tax rates for the rest of your life. Um, and so, you know, there are plenty of policy levers by which we could incentivize national service. And I would point out that in my home state of California, we have such a shortage of firefighters that prisoners are released from prison to be firefighters. That's a great area where the youth of America could uh, get some job skills and some excitement outside of military service. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of, I mean, paved roads all over the country. There are lots of things we could do, uh, but I would suggest that those of us old people who are advocating national service ought also to have it uh, as a retirement requirement for us and everybody else who advocates it to do our year as well. Just a couple of thoughts. I, I agree with Peter. I don't think the time to, to judge whether the AVF is survival or not is right now, but I, I, I'm, I'm more worried about the risks of uh, 30 years of, and this is kind of the topic of this conference, 50 years now, of the American people being conditioned to believe that someone else fights for them, that they have no responsibility to serve the nation no matter what kind of war we get in, what, no matter what conflict, no matter what threat, that that's, that's the military job. And, and we have an all-volunteer military. That means if my kids don't have to go, I don't have to go. My, my, my dad's not going. That's the first time in American history that has been true. Uh, we've never had, we've always had an expectation that in time of war that we would have to expand the military. And in the Civil War, and the First World War, and the Second World War, and the Korean War, and then all the way through the Cold War, we maintained that. And that's been erased now. And so if we get ourselves in a war that requires more than how many volunteers we can generate this particular year or next year, we, we now have a population that believes that's not their responsibility anymore. That's a huge problem for us because a bigger war will require more people. We've seen what's happening in Ukraine in terms of casualties and attrition of everything from you know, tanks and aircraft to human beings, which we have the, you know, the most precious commodity we have. We're not prepared for that. Not that. That worries me more on the long-term viability of the all-volunteer force and the notion that there is no expansibility of that beyond the Guard and Reserve. Uh, and it, and when, when that's expended, then we're out of schlitz. We're done. We, we're, we're stopped. We, don't, we are not going to cross that line. And we have a lot of people now that don't think that's part of what the government, even though the Supreme Court has said otherwise, that's what the government is, is actually in, enabled to do in, in our society. So... That, that's worrisome for me. The other angle on this that I, I, I see in my social media world now that is very unsettling to me is how veterans that, or at least are represented in that space, the people that are my contemporaries, that are a lot of whom, or most of whom are in the enlisted force when I knew them, how much their support for the U.S. military has plummeted in the last you know, 10 years, let's say. And, and that, that how that, you know, I've mentioned this to some folks in the senior military leadership recently, that, that I really worry that the, the veterans are, are seized with the idea of anti-wokeism. And again, I'm not saying who I see as a representative sample, but it's certainly a sample, pretty big sample of the units that I was in during my time there. And these aren't generals, these are retired sergeant majors and first sergeants and you know, senior enlisted people when they left the military after a career. And, and, and we're seeing in polling, you know, uh, Nora Bensell and I use this in our military basics, how much the support for veterans population for coming in the military has plummeted in the last three or four years. That's troubling because there's such a large segment of that population, including, you know, Michelle's son, my two sons, you know, lots of people in the military. That's a family business. And if we lose that connection, we're going to be in even deeper trouble in the recruiting world. So that community, I think we need to think about how we reach out and touch them in ways that we haven't thought about in the past. Thanks, sir. Okay, we'll start with questions from the audience, please. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Major Sharon Sisparo. Um, there's been significant discussion about the polarization of our military, um, but one of the most important aspects or significant aspects of this 
I think, in my opinion, is the role of foreign actors with mis and dis disinformation, and especially how they're, uh, they're reaching our service members uh, and their families uh, on social media. But unfortunately, we've done very little to educate our force about this, um, and because we know it leads to polarization. I could just use any of your thoughts, if you have any thoughts on it, on maybe um, how you see it, and then also if you have any suggestions on how we attack this. <coughs> I think it's a really important point. And, you know, building on the decision to ban TikTok off, you know, government and military devices, um, not only because of data concerns, but because of the potential use of that platform to push out messages that are, you know, strongly influenced by the Chinese government. I do think we need to, edu it is an education process that you, we need to educate the rank and file. Uh, about um, how to decide what is true on social media. We need to do a better job of tagging disinformation and misinformation, not we, the, the government, but the, the platforms um, and the, um, the service providers need to do a better job of tagging and flagging things that are from suspicious sources or, or sus suspect. Um, this is only get, gonna get harder with the problem of deep fakes and the quality that uh, deep fake videos are now uh, taking on. It's only going to get harder if um, adversaries start using um, generative AI to sort of scale these campaigns to be even more, <laughs> uh, more problematic. So I think there's a huge education campaign that, that we need to do within the, within the force just to make uh, people aware. I would say that that's that the effort to ban TikTok is one of the few cases w we can pick in recent memory where uh, the, our political leaders have violated the yes minister rule, which the yes minister, you know, the British yeah. TV show says the only, the way to get a politician not to do something is to tell them it's courageous, uh, and then of course they won't do it, but. I think trying to ban TikTok, in, given its penetration among young potential voters, is courageous. In, and I'm, I'm not criticizing the decision. I'm suggesting that actually that provides an opportunity. Because if they're willing to do yeah. the TikTok out of concerns about uh, data collection, it's only, it doesn't take a lot of additional argument to say, well, true. actually, the real concern is not just data collection, but also manipulation. And by the way, here are some naming and shaming examples of foreign actors who've done exactly mm -hmm. that. Uh, and here's an example of, you know, this is how far it's penetrated. It actually got into the congressional record. <laughs> you know, someone yeah. in, put in ja uh, Chinese pro propaganda into the, right. the congressional record. That's how pervasive this problem is. And... I th so I think there, we, we, everyone, uh, but um, the chattering class needs to be more uh, uh, willing to name and shame that kind of external influence. And, and it, it's not a part, it should not be yeah. a partisan issue. Right. It should offend every American when uh, there, it's ex male malevolent actors are doing that uh, to us. We should only be doing it to ourselves. And so uh, <laughs> let, the, um, let the naming and shaming uh, go on. And I think that, that would help. Yeah, I think I would just double down on what Michelle suggested is that the media literacy aspect, particularly within the military, you can control what, how you train people inside the military. That's got to be part of their training and recurrent training so they can see what's, this is evolving very quickly. It's going to continue to move in new directions. What you learned in, in high school or in college is going to be applicable in three or four years. So the, the military is going to have to take this on as something that they continue to educate the, their workforce, if you will, their, their uh, uh, folks in uniform, in both which will bleed over into their personal lives, obviously, as well as their military lives. It's a bigger problem for American society. And you know, there are some countries that are doing this pretty well. I saw Finland is ranked number one in the world on educating their people on media you know, literacy and understanding you know, prejudice and, and bias in media starting like in kindergarten, we, we've got 0.0 of that out right. in the American education system. We, we probably are gonna have to start thinking about that too. Great. In the interest of time, we'll ask you to state 
short questions. We'll start here and then on this side and we'll, we'll throw it open to the panel for final thoughts, please. Sure, uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mike Kinger. I'm a fellow with the Mitchell Institute. Uh, my question regards Congress's role in bridging the civil military divide, specifically the 2002 AUMF, should that be repealed and should Congress reassert itself in their Article I powers? And then secondly, uh, deficit spending. Would we help bridge this divide if we stop paying for wars through deficit spending and actually force a conversation about trade-offs or levying taxes to fund these wars? Thank you, and go ahead, please. Um, hi, I'm a SSP student, second semester. Uh, my question regards how to connect the military to society and whether it would be best to do it by explaining society what is the place of the military in the decision-making process to go to war and how to make that as uh, as apolitical as possible to make sure that military officers can go out and explain society what they do, because I think that the bridge here is to explain society what is the place of the military in government and not what is the place of the military in society. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so a couple questions there. Any, any takers? First on AUMF and um, how to fund our wars. Corey. So I'll take the first two. Um, yes, we absolutely should repeal the AUMF. A big part of the political um, craziness of our country at the moment is that Congress has ceded so much of its constitutional authority on a party basis to the executive. Um, and so, yes, it'd be wonderful uh, to have to vote specifically on what the military, what Congress will permit the commander in chief to do with the military and under what circumstances. I, however, think that kind of careful accountability counts as courage to Peter's earlier yes minister standard. Um, and the same thing applies to actually paying for the wars that we fight and forcing, you know, an end to deficit spending so that we're not stealing from our children. But again, um, uh, who, uh, who's going to step forward and say, yes, you old people who vote in large numbers and the president's just completely politicized cuts to <laughs> entitlement, which means you're never going to get to an end to deficit spending. So we're not serious about either of the undertakings, and it would be wonderful if Congress became serious about equal about either of the undertakings, don't bet your mortgage on it. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I would first like to see Congress uh, do oversight hearings more effectively. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's a, should be a lighter lift <laughs> and we're not uh, there yet. So I, I would put that as let's, let's walk before we run. And there is nothing more American than borrowing to pay for your wars. It's called <laughs> war bonds. That's how we do it, which is not a defense of def deficit spending. No, that's a great point. Uh, but it is a recognition that that is the American way in war. Uh, and so uh, I, I am not sure that I would want to uh, begin by taxing right away. That said, you know, I, in hindsight, I wish the, the Bush administration had imposed a tax on ga a gasoline tax back when it, they could have gotten away with it politically, right, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. That, in that moment, that would have been a moment for uh, a gas tax. But the economics argument against that is we were also facing the seizure of our economy in after the shock and no one was going to malls, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And so that's the last time that's not the right moment to shock the economy again with a big tax increase. So the economics of it don't work as well uh, in in the moment, but that um, that's what I'll say on I'll, that. I'll pile on. I, in principle, absolutely agree with you um, that, you know, we need a new AUMF and that we should pay for the wars that we fight. But if you look at what moment we're in and you look at limited bandwidth um, in Congress in terms of what they can focus on, to me, I'd rather see the serious oversight on the question of how do we meaningfully strengthen deterrence to, to prevent a war with a nuclear armed China in the next five to seven years. It, it, that, I mean, I'd rather have the bandwidth spent there than on, you know, 
arguing the extremes of an AUMF that you'll never build consensus on. So I, I, I agree with you in principle and good governance, but in terms of where I'd actually want Congress to spend their limited bandwidth on these questions, I think there are more urgent and you know, important issues to focus on. The other on. one I'd add, Michelle, is yeah. the defense industrial base. Yes. That, I think, is... The the I'm more worried about fragility. that than I am worried about yeah. the AVF. Because yeah. if, if the balloon goes up and we really <laughs> yeah. need 100,000 more people, I think we'll get the volunteers. But I think they'll show up. Whether we can equip but them. But whether we can them. equip yeah. them and, and replenish them you yeah. know, the, yep. after <laughs> they've exhausted the stocks, that will be harder. That will take longer to build, I yep. think, than... Uh, uh, si uh, expanding the size of the military. So that's, that I, is a higher priority for me. Very quick, and, maybe to touch yes. on your question, I think the military is kind of invisible across most of America out there, unless you live around a big base like Fort Bragg, North Carolina, or Fort Hood, Texas. And they're, they're, the, the exception to that is the Army National Guard in particular, which is in, as you, we heard earlier, 3,000 communities around the country. The military's got to get out of those bases and get out of those you know, reserve centers and go spend time in high schools and spend time at Rotary Clubs and talk about what they do and who they are, and particularly the ones that come from those towns. And I, I think uh, that's costly and it takes time and they're not with their units for training. But in, unless we do a lot more of that, the American people are going to be increasingly isolated and confused about what it exactly is they have a military for and what they do. That personal touch, again, that one call, cup of coffee at a time works for you know, military people going back out to their high schools and to their colleges and to their communities as well. That's a nice point, Dave. With that, please join me in thanking this panel. Good job, panel. <laughs> Nobody fell asleep. That's good. Before those of you who are watching online um, and those gathered here depart the auditorium, I hope you can indulge me in thanking several folks uh, for helping to make this conference a success. First, our keynote speakers, uh, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, and Senator Jack Reed. They didn't shy away from answering tough questions, and their presence here over yesterday and today indicates how important they think these topics are. Second, all of our panelists and our moderators here, several of whom traveled long distances uh, to be here today. Uh, thank you for your work, for your insights, uh, and for your candor. Conferences like these can fall short um, and fall flat when speakers talk around issues or only admire the problem. And we didn't have that, pro we didn't have that issue at this conference, I think. So we appreciate all of the tangible recommendations offered um, throughout the conference. And I know that everybody involved and who works on this issue will continue to take up Admiral Mullen's call from yesterday to not let this end here today, but to continue that work. Thank you to Georgetown Center for Security Studies, specifically to Dan Byman and Rebecca Patterson for all of your support leading up to this conference. Um, I also want to um, make a special thanks to the dozen or so of Security Studies students who volunteered throughout this conference and did all of the great behind the scenes work. A special shout out to our audio visual team who made us look and sound better than we ever would on our own. Um, and I also wanna thank our protocol team of Mary Haynes and Jackson, Jackson Menner. I always enjoy talking to seasoned protocol professionals whose first question is usually, will there be any kings or US presidents here? <laughs> no, okay, good, well, what do you wanna talk about? Um, so they are pros and they did a wonderful job. Uh, thank you to the America in the World Consortium uh, for a superb partnership and particularly to Peter. Uh, we first started scoping this conference back in June and very quickly it grew and grew in size and scope uh, because we just concluded that these issues were too important and the timing so appropriate. So thank you, Peter, for being a great co-chair and pass on our thanks to Susie Colburn who's also worked great behind the scenes efforts. Um, there are two people who I wanna specifically recognize and I hope they come forward and take a literal bow. And that is Drayton Cullen who came up from the University of Texas at Austin, who works for Peter through the America in the World Consortium and Jordan Money, our, our very own director of events and communications here at Georgetown. They're probably preparing for the next event, but thank them. <laughs> Lastly, to everybody gathered here today and to those watching online, thank you for your passion and your commitment to these issues. 
I hope we take up the challenge here to continue to address these hard problems and work on tangible recommended solutions moving forward. Our elected leaders are all volunteer, all recruited force, and the American public are counting on, on us. Thank you for attending and have a great rest of the day.